Well, antimicrobial resistance is a very serious problem. It's so bad that the World Health Organization estimates, believe this, or, believe it or not, it will kill at least 50 million people per year by the year 2050. Well, I came across this case study that at least offers a glimmer of hope in this uphill battle, uh, where a patient who had this horrible antibiotic-resistant bacterial infection was very close to death. And he was treated using an experimental therapy involving bacteriophages. Joining me now is the lead author and primary physician on the case, uh, Robert Schooley, MD. Dr. Schooley is a professor of medicine and the chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the UC San Diego School of Medicine. Dr. Schooley, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Okay. Well, before we get, uh, discuss the case, can you give my audience a brief overview of what a bacteriophage is and what phage therapy is? So bacteriophages uh, have been uh, known about for now over 100 years. Uh, Bacteriophage literally means, uh, phage means eat. These are viruses that eat bacteria. And they were discovered uh, in India uh, back at the beginning of the last century when people noticed that if you put um, uh, bacteria that were growing from uh, rivers in India um, onto a auger plate and grew them and then put river water on top of them that included sewage, that there would be holes in that auger plate. And they were able to take, uh, pluck out those holes and realize that there were filterable agents, which is the way you, we used to define viruses, um, that were uh, in the sewer water that were attacking uh, the bacteria and, and therefore killing the bacteria on the, um, on the auger plate. Um, the, initially, uh, because we didn't know really how as much about viruses as we do now, uh, they were just uh, called bacteriophages, uh, factors that ate bacteria. And uh, early on, it was thought maybe we could use these to treat infections. That was at a time before antibiotics were even available. Uh, and for a number of years, there were efforts to try to purify these uh, agents and use them in the treatment of, of human infections uh, over the course of uh, a 20- or 30-year period, uh, particularly um, as time went on in the Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc. The uh, book Aerosmith that many people have read was actually based on uh, the discovery and application of bacteriophages. People want to go back and get a bit of a Sinclair Lewis view of the uh, of the um, uh, field. Mm -hmm. uh, over time, antibiotics came along in the West, and uh, we moved in that direction, thinking they would solve all the problems with uh, uh, killing uh, bacteria in the hospital and. Uh, the uh, Russians and uh, Georgians, not the Georgians uh, down uh, in near Florida, but the Georgians in Georgia uh, and Eastern Europeans stuck with bacteriophages because they were inexpensive and they, they, uh, it was difficult to afford antibiotics uh, uh, after World War II uh, in the Soviet bloc. And they continued to do research with these uh, agents for a number of years, uh, but mainly used them anecdotally in patients uh, in, in studies that were really difficult to evaluate. Um, and uh, kind of kept the field alive. Over the course of the last 10 years or so in the U.S. and in Europe, it's become clear that the discovery of uh, antibiotics is slowing down the uh, spread of multidrug-resistant uh, bacteria has accelerated with the increased use of uh, antibiotics in clinical medicine and also in animal feed. Uh, and uh, this has triggered an interest in trying to see if bacteriophages and other novel forms of therapy can be brought to bear uh, to treat patients with these diseases for which antibiotics are failing. Yeah. Okay, well, let's jump right into the case. Um, can you go ahead and give my audience uh, talk about this amazing and unprecedented story of this patient that you uh, treated? Well, the patient actually was a colleague of mine on the faculty at UCSD. He's, um, from the standpoint of, um, of his privacy, he actually has been quite public about his case and uh, um, has been interviewed himself in the news media, so this is not an issue of, of um, identifying uh, features about him that he hasn't identified himself. But in any case, he and his wife were traveling in um, Egypt uh, over Thanksgiving of 2015, and while there, he acquired a bout of pancreatitis and uh, was hospitalized in Luxor. Um, 
He's an elderly man. Not uh, he was a fit elderly man. He was 67 with diabetes, but uh, a bit overweight, and uh, pretty quickly got quite ill with his pancreatitis uh, in Luxor. They were able to stabilize him with some fluids and some antibiotics and some insulin. And uh, uh, after uh, about a week, he uh, was air evacuated to uh, Frankfurt, where they noted that he had uh, the pancreatitis that was known about. He had a bit of a biliary obstruction, uh, and he also had a pancreatic pseudocyst that uh, was quite large and had uh, had uh, formed in the interim. So they um, put a stent into his biliary tree to drain that and uh, at the same time uh, uh, placed two stents um, or drains uh, into the pancreatic pseudocyst by uh, putting an endoscope um, into his stomach and puncturing the pseudocyst through the stomach wall and drain the pseudocyst that way. The drainage of the pseudocyst grew a multidrug-resistant uh, acinetobacter baumani, which is a gram-negative rod that has become an increasing problem in terms of drug resistance uh, that uh, has posed problems for our troops coming back from the Middle East and for people living in the Middle East. Um, the organism is one that um, we often see in, uh, in the West in patients who've been on other antibiotics for long periods of time, uh, and then gradually select for increasingly resistant organisms. And what's left standing is Acinetor baumani because it's an organism that's quite uh, robust at being able to acquire antibiotic resistance from other organisms around it. So he was found to have this multidrug resistant Acinetor baumani infection in uh, Frankfurt. He was transferred back here after about 10 days in the hospital there and arrived here just before Christmas of 2000. Um, 15, and over the course of the next three to four months, with a uh, or three months, with a series of uh, efforts to drain a number of abscesses that uh, formed in his peritoneal cavity, um, uh, and to deal with his uh, necrotizing pancreatitis, the Acinetor baumani infection um, became progressively more resistant to available antibiotics, more widespread, uh, and he became. Uh, increasingly ill, so we were unable to uh, convince the surgeons that he would be a good operative candidate. Uh, finally, about the uh, end of February, beginning of March, uh, he, it was clear that uh, his course had been pretty inexorably downhill uh, over the previous eight weeks, and uh, he was developing, uh, he'd been transferred to the intensive care unit, ended up getting intubated, was on pressors to uh, maintain a blood pressure um, and uh, had become stuporous to comatose. Um, a friend of his wife, who is an infectious disease epidemiologist, mailed her or emailed her uh, an animal study about uh, bacteriophages, and um, she became intrigued by these and called me and asked if we'd be willing to consider treating her husband with them. And uh, at the time, I said, of course, we're not getting very far with traditional antibiotics, I'm happy to consider anything. And uh, the, uh, his wife got on the phone with uh, Ra Young, who is a very distinguished microbiologist who works with bacteriophages at Texas A&M University. And uh, Ra listened to the story and said, you know, I've never done this before for a patient because I'm a research lab. But I feel so moved by your story about your husband, I'm going to uh, turn my postdocs loose this weekend if you send me the organism and see if we can come up with some bacteriophages that uh, will kill his acinetobacter. Uh, so over the course of the weekend, he did that. And in the parallel, I got in touch with the Food and Drug Administration, and uh, they said, uh, uh, much to my uh, pleasure, that they not only would um, entertain the idea of allowing us to give him as a, these to him as a, under an experimental IND, which is a very standard approach they use for uh, new therapies that hadn't yet been fully evaluated, uh, but they also knew some people at the Naval Medical uh, Biodefense Command who were working on bacteriophages and suggested I get in touch with them because they understood they might have some phages as well. So I got in touch with them, and they too uh, developed some phages uh, that were active against uh, the patient's acetobacter. And uh, uh, over the course of the next week, they grew them up, uh, both laboratories, purified them, and sent them to San Diego. And uh, we were able to administer them to him uh, um, uh, kind of as he was headed toward uh, renal dialysis and uh, with continued uh, deterioration. Um, 
we initially gave the bacteriophages from Texas A&M into his, uh, he had about five abscess cavities in his abdomen by that time that were being drained by uh, drains that we had placed, the, uh, that the interventional radiologist had placed um, percutaneously. We initially gave the phages through that route, uh, but uh, and didn't see a lot of um, of change, uh, although he stopped deteriorating as rapidly as he had. And after about 48 hours, the Navy phages were ready to go, and we decided that with his clinical course uh, and having already tried the um, intracavitary phages, the way to go was try to get these phages systemically because we were growing Bacter from uh, his uh, all of the abscesses in his abdomen, from his peritoneal cavity, from his sputum, and we felt that we needed to try to treat him systemically. So we began to use the bacteriophages intravenously on a Thursday evening, and by Saturday, he um, his presser requirement was dropping rapidly. He opened his eyes, recognized his daughter, and over the course of the next several months, with a fairly complicated course that we would expect from a patient in an ICU with his underlying uh, diabetes who'd been debilitated by being intubated for as long as he had. Uh, he gradually got better, and he's now back here at work as a uh, professor at UCSD. So it was a very gratifying uh, experience and uh, one we were really pleased uh, happened for him. Yeah, great news. Now, do bacterial uh, phages, do they get resistance like an antibiotic does? They do, and that's one of the things that has been going on for millions and millions of years. We're, we ourselves are uh, kind of a Darwinian chamber. of uh, We have a gut full of bacteria that are being constantly attacked by bacteriophages. The bacteria in our gut develop resistance to the bacteriophages, and the bacteriophages evolve so that the next generation of bacteriophages can attack the next generation of bacteria. Gotcha. So this is uh, something that um, is... Um, is probably the best example of uh, kind of ongoing selection uh, in biology um, in that uh, phages and bacteria have been in uh, close contact with each other since um, both of them evolved from um, from non-living material, if you will. Right. Uh, in this case, we, and in, in clinical use of bacteriophages, you do a couple of things. The first thing is that you develop a cocktail of bacteriophages uh, that have different mechanisms of action uh, and give them all at one time so that the bacteria have to contend with three or four uh, bacteriophages rather than one all at once, uh, which makes it more difficult for them to develop uh, antibi- uh, antibi- or anti-phage resistance. Um, in Tom's case, uh, we saw the um, resistance develop over the course of uh, about a week and a half in the, to um, we continue to grow uh, Acinetobacter from his uh, uh, from his drains, although to a somewhat lesser extent. And the ones we grew uh, became resistant to the um, to the bacteriophages that he was receiving. So the Navy took those new uh, bac- uh, bacteria that were resistant to the first generation of bacteriophages, developed another cocktail. So you can do the same thing in the laboratory that goes on in a patient and develop successive uh, generations of phages to attack uh, the bacteria in front of you. Interesting. Um, I know you're short on time, Dr. Schooley, but uh, quickly, what is the future of phage therapy in the U.S., and will you be doing any, doing any follow-up research on this? Well, you know, it's a, this is a very early um, demonstration, really, that it's feasible to do. I have to be uh, I'm, I'm a quite conservative, um, circumspect person. I can't tell you right now whether or not we're certain that the phages were what turned him around as his physician. Uh, it certainly, from the standpoint of looking at his clinical course, it was quite convincing to me that we were getting nowhere with antibiotics and his course turned around when we administered the bacteriophage. But I think more important than whether or not, in this case, this was the thing that made the difference, regardless of what I think, what is clear is that it's quite feasible now with the technology available to uh, isolate an organism from a sick patient that you can't treat with antibiotics and to, within a relatively short period of time, come up with bacteriophages that can be given clinically and that we clearly showed in this case uh, had an impact on his organisms because they developed resistance to it. Uh, some experiments I haven't talked about, there's evidence that they changed their capsule and were less um, less pathogenic. And I think that 
um, the, it's quite feasible to do this now. Uh, the trick is going to be figuring out how to more rigorously evaluate it so that we aren't in a situation uh, uh, in which uh, we have, oh, yes, it seems to work, um, sorts of statements without rigorous proof. And that will require the same kinds of clinical trials that we've used to develop new antibiotics and, uh, and other um, uh, drugs over the, uh, over the years. One of the pieces of good news is the FDA uh, very much understands both the very um, tenuous pipeline of new traditional antibiotics and the serious problem of multidrug resistant bacteria. And so they realized that uh, new methods are needed. They were very helpful, actually, in this particular case in providing uh, advice about how to use the bacteriophages and were very proactive from a regulatory perspective. And have been thinking a lot about how best to evaluate these agents. So I think that with the right kinds of clinical trials uh, and a, uh, an agency that at this point is really quite enlightened about this being something that needs to be evaluated, uh, clinical trials can occur and we'll learn as time goes on um, how to use them and if, um, if they have an effect and if they do what the best patient populations are to, uh, uh, to benefit from. So I, I think it's at a point now that... Uh, we should begin to think about planning um, more structured clinical trials. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Robert Schooley, for your time and expertise and sharing this remarkable story with us. I appreciate it. Sure. Good luck. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.